Hi, everyone. This is Alex Epstein, host of Power Hour. And today we have another Best of Power Hour. This one is a, a popular one among many longtime listeners. And it is about the true physics of CO2. Several years ago, I saw a documentary called Climate Hustle. And actually, Climate Hustle 2 is coming out, I think, in April. And I'm featured in it, or at least I was interviewed for it. And my picture is on the website. So that's a little development in and of itself. But anyway, on the original Climate Hustle, there was this uh, very intelligent seeming person, uh, Dr. Denny Rancor, a physicist. And he had, the, the way he just talked about CO2 had a level of precision that intrigued me. So I decided to have him on the show. And he helped me a lot with my own thinking about how CO2 works. And particularly the issue of the greenhouse effect being what's called a, a decelerating or logarithmic effect. Why it is that for every new, you know, every new molecule of CO2 in the atmosphere has less of a warming influence than the last one did. By the way, sorry about my voice. I don't know. It's been shot for about the last day or so. Hopefully I don't have a cold or anything like that. So highly recommend listening to this. And you can also learn more about Dr. Rancor at his blog called Climate Guy. So I believe it is climateguy.blogspot.com. And yeah, I hope you enjoy. If you haven't ordered your copy of the new version of The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels uh, coming out later this year, you can go to amazon.com and pre-order it. Just search for Moral Case for Fossil Fuels revised and it should come up. Also, if you want to be on my mailing list and you're not, go to alexepsteinlist.com and sign up. All right, that's it for this week. Oh, wait, one other thing, actually. If you have any requested guests for Power Hour, let me know. I am very strongly considering bringing back guests from outside my organization. And I have one lined up already, but I'm thinking about doing it a lot more regularly. So if there's anyone you want and any topic you want, let me know. Just email, uh, let's see, just email Don, actually, Don Watkins. So email Don at industrialprogress.net and he'll forward them to me and process them all. All right. Talk to everyone soon. Uh, until next time, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Cool. Oil. Natural gas. Power Hour. The show where today's top energy experts break down today's top energy issues. No sound bites. No talking points. No nonsense. No BS. No softball questions. No vagueness. Just in-depth analysis and ruthless clarity. Power Hour. Here's your host, Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. All right, well, this week is going to be about a power hour and 15 minutes uh, because we've got a great interview that I already conducted. It's with Professor Denny Rancor of the University of Ottawa, a physics professor, or actually a former physics professor. That's one thing we'll get into. Uh, that's all interesting issues surrounding the fundamental issue we're going to talk about, uh, which is the physics of CO2 and climate. I saw... Professor Rancor recently in the film Climate Hustle. I thought he was one of the highlights of the film. I hadn't heard of him before, but I could tell immediately this guy has a remarkable grasp of the scientific issues. He has an ability to explain them. And when I started reading his blog, I could see that he really had some insight. So I had some questions, for example, about the greenhouse effect, and he had better answers than anyone I've ever talked to. But as you'll see, we talk about all kinds of things. Some really interesting disagreements come up, as well as just straight enlightenment. And, of course, there are many things, as you might imagine, that we agree on. Uh, but main thing, you will learn a lot. And this guy is, uh, whether he's right or wrong on things, he's really, really smart, really interesting to listen to. So enjoy. Power Hour. Because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. We are joined now by Dr. Denny Rancor, former professor of physics at the University of Ottawa. Denny, welcome to Power Hour. I'm happy to be here, Alex. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, I am very excited to encounter a new and interesting mind in the field of, of climate science because I thought I had, I had encountered all of them, and then I saw 
uh, Mark Morano's documentary Climate Hustle last week, and you had some of the most interesting comments. And I could just I, I fancy myself uh, very good at, at at discerning precise thinking, and the way you just worded things uh, impressed me. And then you had a review of the the movie that was mostly complimentary, but you you made some what I regard as very discerning comments. We'll link to it online just about the nature. Uh, of of certain things about CO2 being misrepresented as a trace gas and the idea that, well, if, if there's a tiny amount of CO2 relative to our own perception, then it doesn't matter that much. And, and I thought uh, you did a great job at, at calling out, even though you overall approved of the movie, calling out certain imprecise things. So I always admire the willingness to call out people on one's own side. So then I started doing a little bit more research and I said to the team, we have to have this guy on, on Power Hour. And in particular, you have... a uh, you have a very interesting background. So tell us about your background in physics, and then I'll then I'll get into how you got into the climate issue. Right. Well, you, you, you're right about my uh, not being able to not criticize. It's a character defect of mine. I've I've criticized everyone who's ever been on my side on anything. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I was a full and tenured professor at the University of Ottawa, and uh, for over two decades, I did physics at at a high level, both theoretical and experimental. And in the second half of my career at the University of Ottawa. I moved into environmental science, so I became quite a prominent re environmental researcher. I had some of the largest uh, funding and so on. So, the, you know, that, that was the story of my career at the University of Ottawa. And then because of this character defect that I mentioned, I, I was very critical of my employer and uh, many of the things that the university was doing and not doing. And so uh, I was dismissed, even though I had tenure. And that is still before the courts. That's still being fought now, my dismissal. Uh, yes, uh, there's an interesting video online with you. And what's this? I forget what the show is. It's, uh, we'll, we'll put a link to it. But uh, I was on the guy's show as well. Uh, I mean, Steve something, but it's a 25-minute interview, which is, it gives a lot of interesting views of, of how you think of your job uh, as an educator. So we'll make sure that the listeners uh, uh, see that. But right. Well Oh, go ahead. There were an awful lot of such interviews. I'm not sure exactly which one you're referring to, but when I was dismissed, it was a national, even an international story at the time. It was talked about, I mean, there were two articles in the New York Times about it and so on. So it was a big event, and so I, I did give a lot of uh, interviews in, in those years. So one thing, if people look into your resume, they can see you've done extensive work into uh, many different brand in, in many different branches of, of physics. At what point did you become interested in and critical of uh, the way climate science was being conducted? Oh, as soon as I encountered it. I mean, I, I as I said, I shifted to environmental science, and I started seeing a lot of government environmental scientists pushing certain agendas. And I couldn't see the scientific evidence that would back their their approach or their perspective. So I, I was critical right from the start. As soon as I entered into the into the field, luckily I I met people who were also critical or who were appreciative of uh, someone new being critical because they were things they didn't dare say themselves and so on. So I did I did quickly uh, become fairly prominent in 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 environmental geochemistry and so on. Um, and so, yeah, that it just went that way. So what's an example of, of an early thing that, that you noticed? Well, um, I noticed, for example, that, that a lot of environmental scientists who are studying the boreal forest in Canada, which is the largest eco, the boreal forest in, in, on the north of the planet, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere is the largest ecosystem on Earth. There's a lot of people studying it. It's economically important and so on. And what I noticed was that the government environmental scientists and the ones who get government grants that are university scientists were studying uh, minute little effects related to pollution and things like that. And the, the, the detailed scientific mechanisms of these small effects, um, like how bacteria help to... Uh, you know, at, at the micro level, and we're never vocal about the macro level, which, which is, you know, there, there were huge changes operating in the boreal forest for the last many decades that have transformed the lakes in the boreal forest in particular, and the landscape, which has, you know, tremendous environmental impacts 
which were sim they, they were simply generally silent to those and 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 kind of had tunnel vision in their special in their specialities using sophisticated equipment things like that so i i noticed that the conferences were dominated by that kind of an approach very reductionist approach and that that not many scientists were willing to to be outspoken about some of the really egregious things that were happening and you know and so i started reviewing the the field and doing an awful lot of reading and attending conferences and people were very generous with their time uh, introducing me to the field and so on and I realized that there have been some big swindles in the past you know like if you look at the uh, acid rain story I mean everyone was concentrated on this problem as it was described in the scientific literature of acid rain which is a very subtle thing that you you have a difficulty actually measuring the effects of acidic rain on the landscape. Meanwhile, the the boreal forest is being completely transformed. The lakes are being uh, killed off, and so on. And everyone, all the scientific literature and all of the efforts and grants and everything, is going into the study of acid rain, which is ridiculous. And so I I, I looked at the history of it. I could I couldn't believe it. Now, uh, so so that's that's another example. Yeah. So that that seems to be an example of this interesting prioritization shift among self-proclaimed environmentalists, and and the author Peter Huber talks about this in the book Hard Green, where there seems to be less and less focus on what people would call environmental protection, uh, just of you know of 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 nature. And this enormous focus on these byproducts of industry and just, you know, just, you know, so whether it's acid rain or, of course, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. So what do you, uh, what, what was your suspicion well, about the cause of this? It's not an accident. I mean, there are political and psychological uh, phenomena at play here. I mean, it, a scientist can talk about, you know, uh, the composition of the atmosphere or acidic rains on the continental scale, but um, he or she had better not be critical of a massive corporation that is the main player in a in a given province in Canada, for example. You see, so it it's you, that's one thing is that you're it's you you come to understand that your uh, social commentary as a scientist is very constrained. You can't go against the big economic players and the major interests in society, which are the funders of the university and so on. You, you just can't do that. And so you tend to choose topics. Um, and and there's, there's, there's also a groupthink effect where a topic becomes considered to be important uh, w within the science community. And then there's kind of this inflation of the importance of that topic and it becomes the the subject of specialized conferences and special issues in journals and so on. And everyone's happy because you create this community of people who promote each other and who publish a lot in 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 a in a in a specialty like this. But if you step back and ask yourself, well, how important is that specialty? How important is that entire body of work? Often the answer is not very important at all. There's no, there's no. If you if you try to get an objective measure of why we would do this, uh, often the answer is there's no reason other than the government is happy to fund it, and scientists are happy to do it to advance their careers. Uh, so, so the the second part of that definitely makes sense to me and I, I've, I've heard others talk about it and, and you can just see those kinds of incentive systems with these well-funded subcultures whether in science or anything else the corporation thing is is a longer discussion because I mean there's an enormous anti-corporate sentiment historically and today uh, against the fossil fuel industry you know which is is a dominant industry in the world and yet it is the target and we see you know significant portions of it being shut down uh, particularly the coal industry in the United States. So the idea that, I mean, academics are very, historically very anti-corporate in certain ways. Now, there are definitely these other relationships because they're funded by them. Uh, but so there's a lot of interesting interplay there. But 
Uh, in, in well, I, I, I can't say that I agree with that assessment. I mean, okay. maybe we don't have the same academics, the ones, the ones I've met and the ones that you know, but uh, I, I tend, academics generally are subservient and o obedient and follow the trend of, you know, what will be funded and what, what do the bosses uh, think and feel. Uh, so they're very much like that, and as as a result, at least the the uh, government and and university academics that I know in Canada and that I know of um, are not very critical of uh, the power players in society and in the economy. Not at all. No. Well, part so part of this is, go, is gets to you know you know issue that's that's mostly outside the scope of of this particular scientific issue of how bad do you regard certain actors as? Because if I have a much higher regard for certain actors and I say, well, I think academia is being too hard on them. And then if you have a really negative regard, you can say, well, academia is being too easy on them. So I think in many... No, see, I, I don't have a negative regard of industry in the sense that they're bad or they're... What, what my main concern is I want uh, the reporters and the people who are supposedly studying the, these phenomena on the landscape scale to be honest, to be straight up and to uh, say everything that needs to be said. Um, and I don't think that, that behaving in that way is harmful to industry. Uh, on the contrary, it, it's simply part of the discourse, the discussion that needs to be had. And I think it would be beneficial to the economy to have that kind of honesty. So it's, I, I, I'm, I guess I just have a different perspective of how science behaves than, than the one you've described. Well, I mean, I think that there is an interplay of how the corporations intersect with the universities, but I think ultimately a lot of it is set by people in the humanities who are, well, you, and, and, oh. and that's, you know, my own background at looking right. at those people and they, if you look at how they speak, what, how they advocate, they're not, you know, it's not that they're, they don't need the same kind of grant money. They don't have the exact same time. Now that, you know, they do their own little projects and stuff, but it's like, hey, give me 40 grand to write a book or something like that. Right. So, so they're very different. And that's, you know, I grew yes. up with the philosophers and the political scientists, and they're very happy to slam anything that has to do with industry. Sure, sure. I was referring to the scientists and the engineers and that network. And the, the scientists and engineers right now, are predominantly going along with global warming alarmism. And I believe there is reasons for that. I think that's, this is what the most powerful players uh, in, in, in the economy want. They want a carbon economy at the global scale. They want that kind of uh, planification. They want those political and financial instruments in order to control other emerging economies and in order to extract uh, wealth uh, through through financial devices as well. So, I mean, it's clear to me at this time that the, the, the strongest players really want this. That's why it's funded. That's why the majority of scientists uh, uh, are pushing things in that direction. It, it, it's not an accident and it's not a, 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 um, a spontaneous result of how science evolves. That's just a total myth. Uh, science always follows uh, establishment science funded science always follows the the dominant trend that is set for them that that is clear and there there are many many uh, studies that demonstrate this uh you know it's it's beyond a doubt so so if you want to know what the most powerful players uh desire and want on in a in a country or on the planet Simply ask, you know, what are the scientists doing? And that'll tell you what they want. <laughs> it's that it's that straightforward. That, that's that's a really interesting perspective. So we've talked a bunch about motives, which we're obviously both interested in. But to for that question to even logically arise uh, assumes that there's something fundamentally wrong with climate science as it's practiced, because the establishment would just say, as you indicated as being the wrong view, that, well, this is just what we discovered. You know, we, the scientific community, we just want to understand how climate works. And we uncovered that CO2 is this dominant driver of climate. It's leading to runaway global warming. We can model it. And that's going to lead to catastrophic climate change that will obliterate the human race. And that's why we want to do all of these things. So obviously, you and I both disagree with that. I'm interested in, in why you disagree with that. What What do you think 
is the if there is one is the the fundamental uh, mistake of climate catastrophism in terms of physics. Well, you know, there's there's two aspects to this. I mean, there's your question. You know, what 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 are some of the the errors that scientists make in in when they when they write a paper, for example? And uh, there's there's the other aspect, which is you know why are they behaving this way? <laughs> and I get so we'll we'll go to the first question uh, first. Like you know why why are they blinding themselves? Why are they accepting to be these simpletons who 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 do these just 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 nonsense superficial stuff where they could be trying to get at the heart of the scientific. Right. But most people don't. So I'm just saying, let's establish that they are doing that because for most right. people, it's it's this sophisticated, cutting edge, well-informed uh, right. science. Right. So I've looked at the, the radiation balance physics of the planet. And, you know, a physicist uh, can can do that. If, if he or she puts her, his mind to it, you can figure this out. And there's enough uh, data from satellite measurements, and there's enough uh, publicly available information about radiation, the sun, the planets, the properties of, of uh, Earth's surfaces, the properties of the atmosphere, and so on, that you can actually do the calculations. And so I have done that, and I have uh, discussed my calculations with le one leader in the field in particular, who was, even though he... Um, is part of the warmest gang, he couldn't find an error in any of my calculations. So I, I do calculate that the uh, result from doubling CO2 on the planet is a, a, a warming, an average warming. If that's all that happens and, and the complex planetary system does nothing else, only that, which is ridiculous, that never happens, so it's a, it's a thought experiment. But the number I get is about is 1.4 degrees Celsius. So that's exactly pretty much the number that everybody gets with much more so-called sophisticated, you know, uh, general circulation models and so on. So we agree that, uh, you know, you can do the physics. It's straightforward, and you can you can do these calculations. But the problem is. Um, you know that that doesn't mean anything. This is doubling the CO two, and you get a one degree increase. Like who cares? Um, the for, first of all, it it will clearly the calculation shows that CO two will not be the controlling factor. You you can do this calculation in your mind, but it doesn't tell you a lot. It doesn't tell you about the other things that happen simultaneously. It doesn't tell you whether or not. You know what is causing the accumulation of CO two in the atmosphere, and all the things that can happen in terms of of um, the different pools of CO two on the planet that that are massive that can take up CO two, remove it from the atmosphere, or put it into the atmosphere, and so on. It doesn't tell you about any of those things. It's just, it's just a, a thought experiment that a physicist does. Fine, you can do that. Um, and what you find when you do those thought experiments, uh, I mean, the, 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 you, you think up the conditions, you do the calculation, is that, in fact, even just in the simplest calculations, there are factors other than CO2 that have an order of magnitude more importance in terms of their potential impact on mean surface temperature of the planet. For example, the surface properties of the planet. Okay, so... There, there are important surface properties. One is, is um, the, the, the uh, albedo, which is how much the surface reflects, but another is um, the emissivity of the surface, which tells you how efficiently it emits infrared, for example. Those properties are very sensitive to the type of surface. So if uh, it's vegetation covered versus uh, sand, uh, in a desert versus water, the, these properties are very different. Well, the the thing that humans do most is transform the landscape by their activities. Uh, so there's huge potential for humans uh, transforming these surface properties of the planet. And the sensitivity to those changes is 10 times greater than from a, 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 a proportionate change of CO2. So, but 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 there's no research being done on that. That no, there's virtually in comparison to the CO two question and the sinks and sources of CO two and all of this inflated science about CO two. There's virtually nothing being done on things that physicists will tell you 
straight up in a very straightforward calculation must be 10 times more important. What, what do you mean by, I think you use the term controlling factor at the beginning of your description. What, what exactly does that mean? Well, it, it's a radiation balance calculation. So, um, you know, the, the, the main source of energy that is affecting everything on the planet is the sun. And uh, if we were to receive all of the sun's radiation and keep it, uh, we would burn up. So we send radiation back out into space, mostly in the form of infrared. So that it's, that, it's that balance that determines uh, between the incoming and the outcoming radiation that determines what the surface temperature of the planet will be. Uh, that, you know, that's, that's f first year, uh, you know, college physics. I, I remember in first year college, we, we did that calculation in my chemistry class. So that, that's, that's pretty well known. And you can, you can get into the details of that calculation and uh, make it very realistic. And then you can ask, as you do that calculation, you can ask, well, what happens if I change this? What happens if I change that? And so you look at, you, within, the, within the calculation itself, you look at, well, what are the things that are important that are really determinant in terms of the surface temperature? And these things are the properties of the atmosphere. CO2 is one of the, is one of the things that affects the properties of the atmosphere, the radiation properties I'm talking about. And the other factors are the two that I mentioned. Uh, well, there's also the properties of the atmosphere includes its, its own reflectivity and absorption and so on, which includes clouds and things like that. And then there's the surface properties of the planet itself. And those are highly dependent on humidity of the vegetation. For example, a grassland will have very different radiation surface properties than a forest. Uh, now, is it a tropical forest or is it a dry coniferous forest and so on? So all of this changes these surface properties that in turn change the radiation balance on the planet. Um, but it's a planet, it's huge. And, 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 and there's a, a, a mosaic of surfaces and so even if you're making large scale uh, changes over here, you're also making other someone else for different economic reasons or whatever is making other changes over there. And so in, in the end, it's, it's hard if you're not doing a, a coordinated effort, it's hard to change uh, the overall average uh, temperature of the planet. But, but, but looking at those factors from a physics point of view, the surface properties are much more important than the CO2. I want to go back to the idea of, of the doubling of, you know, the physicists agreeing that doubling the amount of CO2 will lead to 1.x uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, yeah. This goes, I mean, this goes to the, the point of uh, the greenhouse effect, I mean, or infrared absorbers as, as a, a logarithmic function. If I get anything wrong, I'm sure you'll correct me. But what I'm interested in, you mentioned this a little bit in your, in your um, review of Climate Hustle. I'm interested in the mechanics of why that is. Why is it that you get diminishing returns with every new molecule of CO2 yeah, yeah. in the atmosphere? Why isn't it just this blanket that makes us all infinitely hot as it accrues? Right. Well, you see, it, the optical phenomenon is called saturation. That's, that's a word that has a specific meaning in, in, in the physics of optics, okay, in, in the optical properties of materials. So it, it, it's, it, what it means is right, right now the, the CO2 is in the atmosphere is saturated in the infrared absorption band that's relevant, okay? What that means is the CO2 completely, within that frequency band, the CO2 completely absorbs the, the infrared as it's going out. So adding more CO2 can't make it more absorbent because it already virtually completely absorbs the CO2 within that band, you see? So for that reason, adding CO2 is a, is, is a weak effect because of this physical property of so-called optical absorption. Oh wait, didn't didn't you uh, so, say that so, the, didn't you say before that the that most of the uh, what was it most of the heat transfer you know most of the you, you know we'd burn up uh, unless we it, the energy went out to space or the heat went out to space and most of it was in the form of infrared. That's right, and so that I was referring to the absorption band of CO two, okay? Because CO two 
the CO2 molecule resonantly absorbs only at certain frequencies within the wide infrared. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. So within the frequencies that it can absorb, it is saturated. Okay. So what that means is when you when you double the CO2, um, let's say, then the 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 within that band very little changes the thing is because you've got now twice as much co2 the edges of the bands are a little bit more absorbing than they were okay so you're you're looking at a an edge of band effect if you like and that's what gives rise to this logarithmic um because you're looking only at the edge of the band that's what gives rise to this logarithmic effect that you that you mentioned that you alluded to and that is the phenomenon of saturation that I that I named that way so so uh, yeah doubling sounds like a lot but because you're saturated there's no significant net effect um, it's also for that reason that um, for uh, critics of the warmest crowd to say well co2 is a trace gas so you know why are we worried about it is kind of nonsensical because it doesn't matter that there's a small amount in the atmosphere what matters is how effectively within its resonance band does it absorb infrared and even if it's a small amount it's still saturated so there's no point in talking about whether it's a small amount or a large amount it's saturated that's the relevant optical phenomenon here and that's all that we need to say uh, so using this word trace as though um, you were trying to diminish what the other side is saying is 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 just an uh, a false argument. Yeah, and, and often people will say, and and at nearly the same time, oh, if it weren't for the greenhouse effect of, of CO two or greenhouse effect, we wouldn't. They acknowledge that the the earlier amounts of CO two were extremely consequential in in helping us be warm. Uh, so it doesn't make any sense to say, oh, well, there's just a tiny amount of it. But I want to I want to keep learning more about this point because it's I think it's a criminally ignored point and I think it's a point that can be difficult for non-physicists and I certainly include myself there uh, to grasp so I'm wondering if if so if you talk about saturation uh, and is there is there a visual or an analogy that's helpful or is it, yeah I mean I'm, I'm just trying to well be able I to, mean, the, what else what else acts in this way the the college teacher that is, is explaining it to imagine a, a window and you paint it black. No light is getting through. Now paint a, a second quote on there. What difference does it make? None. Because the light's not getting through. It's just, it's not getting through. Once once you've painted enough on that it's not getting through, putting more on is not going to make a difference. Okay, that's the simple explanation. Uh, of course, with a uh, resonant absorption band, it's a little different because you've got an edge of the band and you can absorb at, at frequencies that are, you know, uh, moving outside of the band a little because you've got a lot more CO2 now all of a sudden. So there is, there is this logarithmic effect instead of a, a straight cutoff that, you know, you reach saturation and nothing gets through from then on. Instead, there's this logarithmic uh, decrease in the... Uh, additional amount of uh, absorption that you'll get. So that that, that so I, that works for me to a certain degree. If if you're just thinking of the the capacity of CO two and the the types of infrared light it can absorb, uh, but right. if you think of the window, so you have this. Okay, the first coat is you know a little bit can get through the second coat even less. Like you get that, but that that's analogous to that. But in in the context of the window we're just you know the person will just think of it as okay well now it's it's dark so well that's true the the window is not a great example because it leaves out the frequency band of the radiation that the, the fact that even within infrared you've got a huge very wide band and so water absorbs at many other frequencies than the co2 does and so on and water is a greenhouse gas as well so it, it is more complicated than than the window but you know how how do you reduce uh the whole complex idea to just a few words that's the question <laughs> well that's i that's that's the question of those of us who like explaining things yeah but, yeah yeah that's right um but how about this so i mean the way i think of it is so as you said that i thought well what you could in a certain sense you could just have like a you know i don't know what what percent what what percentage of the infrared can co2 absorb i mean approximately 
Oh, uh, that's a difficult question, actually. It sounds like an easy question, but it's a difficult question because first you have to look at uh, what is the emission band of infrared on Earth given the average temperature? So that, that's, you know, intensity of infrared being emitted from the surface as a function of frequency. And that, so that's the emission band. That's the amount at each frequency that's being sent out from the surface of the planet. And then you superimpose on that the places, what we call the resonant absorption cross-section, of the various molecules that can resonantly absorb infrared, so that are greenhouse active. So you've got water and CO2, let's say, maybe methane. And so they, within that broad band, which has different intensities being emitted <clears throat> at different frequencies, then you've got these, if you like, you've got these cutout regions that are the absorption bands of the different gases. Okay, so, and then each of those regions has, um, a cross section uh, magnitude. So, so at some resonant frequencies for a given molecule, only a fraction of what would like to get through uh, gets through. And that fraction changes and is a function of frequency within the absorption band. So you have to convolute those two together to answer your question. And um, the, qu the answer is most of it gets out, otherwise we'd fry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, of course, people are, are worried about it. So I'm wondering, what about this? I'm just I'm looking at a window right now, and I'm thinking, okay, well, what if what if you took the painting thing, but it was you painted whatever one twentieth of the window. So no matter how much you painted that one twentieth, the light could still get through. To, yeah, that's true. Uh, but I think you're you're transposing frequency into a spatial. Uh, difference, you know, this region of the window versus the other. Right. Region. I think we're going to have to drop that analogy because it's going to break down. I think it's it's probably better to realize uh, that the window itself, it, while it's transparent to the visible, it's largely opaque in the infrared. So that that window is not transparent at all frequencies. And so, now um, let's say you pick a frequency to send through the window that is at a frequency that where that it absorbs it's opaque at that frequency okay mm -hmm. but you um decide to send a thousand times greater intensity of that one frequency through that window well a little bit is a little bit more is going to get through even though it's opaque in you know opaque in quotations <laughs> technically opaque at that frequency if you're sending a lot more uh, well, some, some will get through, and it's because of these edge effects. There's also some nonlinear effects when it's a really high intensity. So, so it's this idea that uh, opaqueness, if you like, in physics, uh, in the material physics, you know, the interaction between light, light and matter, opaqueness is not an absolute thing. If you, 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 it, it will depend on intensity to some degree, and. Um, how much you turn on the opaqueness by increasing the thickness of the glass, for example, it's it's a nonlinear effect. So you end up getting this logarithmic thing. How do you explain that? Okay, well, we'll, we'll submit it to the listeners, and see. <laughs> I, I think no, I think I think we have some good raw material. I'm definitely gonna gonna think okay. about it. But but in my experience, I will these also th be thinking about it uh, now that you've put that that challenge to me. I'm gonna try to find a a, re a good analogy. Okay, well, I think you know. For this, I've been thinking of it a while, and, and also I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in understanding climate. The way people think of climate is really like the climate as an entity. There, There's helpful ways of, of trying to capture the dynamic and highly variable nature of that. So we we'll probably won't work on that today, but there, I'm just, I'm obsessed with trying to clarify I, these things because they're, they're oversimplified to the other, right. in the other way. I don't know if it's helpful to your listeners, but I this physics paper that we're talking about, which is called Radiation Physics Constraints on Global Warming, CO2 Increase Has Little Effect, th that I actually gave a lecture centered on that paper, trying to explain it to uh, just the average person that walked into the auditorium that day, and that's on YouTube. So one can find that uh, that lecture. It's about and I discuss the 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 politics of the science as well in that lecture. It's about a two hour lecture. It's in two parts, I think, on on YouTube. Okay, well, we'll we'll find that, and and link to it. Okay, so let's let's 
just step back. So we've got this, I, I want people to understand the, the phenomenon of, of how just the, the, core, the core thing about CO2 as an infrared observer is we wouldn't expect it to lead to this kind of dramatic warming. And, and you don't even hear that fact almost anywhere. You don't hear that it's a logarithmic phenomenon. And then, you know, the rationalization that goes after that, that you, you talk about, and I want you to talk about here, is that, well, it's that the CO2 necessarily drives water vapor, which is the more significant greenhouse effect, and this incredibly positive feedback. That's what's going to lead to calamity. And you often hear it described by James Hansen and, you know, other climate scientists as, as just pure physics. It's just, this is physics. This is inevitable. What's the actual status of that claim? Well, I, I would call it pure nonsense. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you know, it's not pure physics by any stretch. That that's not physics. That what I was describing, radiation balance calculations. That's very straightforward. That's robust. But what he is describing, he he is trying to justify a feedback mechanism that he wants to put into this calculation or a calculation like it. Um, and uh, the justification for saying that. Uh, a CO2 increase will be uh, accompanied by an H2O, uh, you know, a, a vapor increase in the atmosphere on average. There, that is extremely tenuous, very difficult to figure out because it's so complicated. Uh, and, you know, we haven't even, we've, we've only begun to understand that complexity of even how water vapor and CO2 might be coupled. So for anyone to say that it's reasonable to do this and, uh, you know, we, we, we have to plan uh, society and the future economy on the basis of this, of this assumption, I think is, is, is uh, misleading. Let's put it that way. Um, you see, because H2O is way more complicated than CO2 because it can condense out of the atmosphere. You can get precipitation, you can get, a, it can form ice on particles, you can get clouds. Clouds uh, affect the, the albedo of the atmosphere. They reflect visible light back out into space. Uh, clouds uh, can precipitate out. Uh, water vapor can, uh, so Water vapor, when it's vapor, can behave like CO2, but it it is not uniformly distributed the same way as CO2 would be over the surface of the planet, or you know, within the within the atmospheric uh, uh, sheet, because of all of these uh, change of phase reactions that I'm talking about that occur with water. So it's. The, the the degree of complexity, and, and we're not even talking about what happens at different uh, altitudes within the atmosphere. That's, that's yet another uh, uh, degree of complexity when you're talking about H2O. So, you know, to, to say that we understand those phenomena um, of how the water vapor is formed, how it's transported, including all the phase changes that can occur, where you know that even cloud precipitation, how you know that is so complicated because in order to get precipitation, and this is something I've written scientific papers about, precipitation theory. Uh, uh, in order to get precipitation, you 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 have to have a particle that will nucleate it, or or else the rate at which it it'll occur is is very very different, orders of magnitude different, or it can happen. Uh, more easily if you ionize the the uh, atmosphere through uh, radiation that comes from the sun. So we're talking about now, um, you know, uh, 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 radiation other than the visible light, which is the main thing that we're we're concerned with. So all of these things, these cosmic rays and everything uh, that that are uh, that have different episodes that are affected by the Earth's magnetic field because they can be shielded to a large extent. A lot of them are charged and they're shielded by the Earth's magnetic field, which itself is changing and varying in magnitude because of the internal uh, magma movements within the Earth and so on and so on and so on. To say that we understand all these things and we can just come up with a, with a proportionality factor between the, uh, H2O in the atmosphere and CO2 in the atmosphere is absurd at this, at this level of understanding of these phenomena. There, there are many phenomena that we haven't even discovered yet that that affect uh, H2O and its dynamics in the atmosphere. So it's it's just uh, 
it's a fairy tale to say those things. It it it's it it appears it's so out there that it has to be motivated by psychological advantage to be making those arguments or careerism or uh, wanting to simplify things because you 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 need a simple picture in order to convince people to fund you or something there have to be all kinds of other reasons because it, it it's inconceivable that someone would actually believe that now, now well one thing they could say and I have my own response to this, but I'm curious what yours is. Well, they'd say, well, yeah, but at least there is a chance this could happen. I mean, if there's a chance that this water vapor feedback could be the way Hansen says it is, then the climate's going to go warming out of control. So if, if we don't fully understand it, shouldn't we be precautionary about it? Yeah, yeah, that that is OK. I I'm going to use a harsh word. That's insane because y you cannot go on there's a chance that this will happen there's a chance that this will be true and if it's true we do these calculations there's these uh, doomsday scenarios that only makes sense if it's probable that it's true okay not if there's a chance that um, it has and with the present state of knowledge I would not ascribe a high probability to them getting the the right uh, amplification coefficient for H2O there so there, you have to look at the, the, the probabilities. And so in this case, you've got layers of probabilities. You've got, well, the number you would like to use or you think is the best one, how probable is it that it's better than any other number in this wide range of what you think are the possibilities within physics and chemistry? Okay, so there's that probability. And then once you've chosen a number, how probable is it that your complex model is actually giving the right answer? And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it get, you can get the right answer from radiation bounds. You can get the right answer from physics. But this isn't about physics. This is about making projections in the future. And so if you're making projections in the, into the future, you have to assume that the uh, complex phenomena that are occurring now are going to be occurring in the same way down the line when you're two or three or five degrees hotter, which is makes no sense. Plus, what is the probability that you're even right in thinking that CO2 is the driver here? I mean, there's, there's a much higher probability, I would argue, based on the scientific evidence, that CO2 is the consequence of all kinds of things, one of which in Earth's history could have been warming. So the, 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 the physics and planetary science of how CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is determined is incredibly complicated. Incredibly complicated. And there are more things that affect that than the probability that CO2 drives warming on the planet. So I'm, 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 that, that's a big bundle. <laughs> I did a lot of talking there, but um, it would take some time to explain each of the elements of all the right. things I just but, said. Um, it just seems, I mean, I'd classify it philosophically as, as arbitrary. I mean, just as in, you can make up anything about anything. And not, not that there's no sort of metaphysical, hypothetical possibility, but if we're just on the premise that anybody can make a model that leads to doomsday for any change in the environment, then uh, you can just well, control anything. For every 10 uh, mechanistic proposal that a, a rise in CO2 will give a rise in H2O, like a vapor in the atmosphere, for every 10 mechanistic proposal that someone wants to make, I can make 10 mechanistic proposals that it will go the other way. And most of these mechanistic proposals on both sides have never been studied. You, we don't know. Okay, they, they, they're, they're, we don't have a grasp of them. We don't have a handle on it. We don't have experiments and observations that would allow us to say anything intelligent about those possible mechanisms. Uh, just, just the just the cloud effect is 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 
incredibly complicated because it depends, you know, what kind of cloud, at what altitude, how dispersed are they? Um, yeah, it's it's beyond uh, being able to make pick, pick a simple number like that to calculate a scenario. All right, one more one more topic I want to cover is the impact on human beings, and you can include ecosystems, ecosystems more broadly if you want, of this hypothesized warming. Because one one subject that's come up over and over is what are the potential motives of people for distorting science, which I think is a really important question you mentioned with Hansen. It can't be anything good. I think for him it's it's really psychological in terms of he came up with a certain thing that his alleged brilliance is attached to, and I think nothing can get him away from that. Other people, I think, just really hate human beings. Uh, but whatever it is, for me, it's most borne out with the area I've most studied, which is, you know, what are the anthropogenic consequences of warming and, and more broadly of, of fossil fuel use? But, you know, what are the consequences of using energy? And it, there just seems to be this arbitrary supposition. There is this supposition that one degree, two degrees Celsius uh, average warming is this catastrophe for human beings. And you, you wrote some really interesting things about uh, how you think the opposite is true. So I'd like you to comment well, on that. Yeah, I mean, there's an awful lot of evidence in, uh, um, you know, paleo evidence. There's an awful lot of historic evidence uh, that the opposite is true. I mean, the planet has seen many eras. Many, all kinds of things have happened on the planet. We have a lot of uh, information about that. And if you look at it, um, generally speaking, life on the planet has done much, much better under warmer conditions. Uh, on, on the time scale of the life of the planet, it is very cold right now. And, you know, we've been experiencing glaciations <laughs> regularly. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's cold compared to the past. And, but when you look at the past, you find that life does extraordinarily well under a warmer uh, and, and wetter climate. So, um, and in fact, you can see that even today. If you just look at today's planet, uh, near the equator is where most of the uh, biomass and biodiversity resides. As you move towards the poles, life has a hard time, let's face it. There's not a lot. There's there's not a lot of living biomass in Antarctica, and you know th there's a direct correlation between uh, you know regional climate and how easy it is to live and how well life does. So you you've got a map right there on the on today's planet of how things go with 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 uh, warming uh, as as you move. Uh, uh, ac across the planet, so I think there's a lot of evidence that there's 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 really nothing to worry about. It, it, it the planet's been ten degrees hotter, and it's been great. Um, um, and why would you think that humans could not adapt to a planet that is more hospitable to every other life form? Why would you Why would you think that 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 just doesn't make any sense? Um, is there any reason to believe that the, you know, you would need something catastrophic to really harm life on the planet. It's, it's eventually, those catastrophic things are eventually going to happen. I mean, the sun is going to burn out, you know, in, in some billions of years, and that'll be the end of it. Um, and it'll get way hotter for a period uh, um, before that happens, and that, that'll be catastrophic. But right now we're in a we're in a period, and we have been for a long time, where the system is incredibly robust. You you can't do anything to to really harm the uh, the the, the uh, biosphere. Um, you would have to remove the atmosphere. You would have to. Uh, there there's a lot of feedback mechanisms, a lot of things happening um, that keep it stable and uh, going, and it's been going for four billion years, more. And so, and there's been life around for all that time. It, it took a while to evolve to this level, but um, so it's, why, no, one degree is nothing. One degree, two degrees is nothing. These are, these, we already see these huge, you mentioned that in, in, in the, uh, in your introduction, the fluctuations from season to season, 
day to night in the same spot in the same season and across the um, uh, different places on the planet are huge. And for the average to change by these small amounts, it would be imperceptible. You have to invent these, these crazy scenarios in order to link that small amount of average temperature change to uh, dramatic changes on the planet. You have to actually invent things. You have to call upon the magic of chaos theory and you have to do all kinds of things. You have to ignore the historical evidence of what has happened on the planet and look instead towards theoretical physics of possibilities in these toy models of, of horrible things that happen under certain circumstances and make up stories in order to think that one or two degrees is going to make any difference. Yeah, also, that's, that, that's what I think. Yeah, so I, I, I definitely agree with all of that. And I'm also on the hunt for, you know, so listeners, I know, Denny, you're going to be thinking about at least the, the first one about uh, saturation and, and how to visually convey that or how to explain that super succinctly. I think in terms of just the, in, the inconsequential nature of an average temperature shift, uh, just showing how inconsequential that is for human life, given the amount of adaptation and adjustment that we engage in to cope with the naturally unstable and hazardous uh, climate situation we find ourselves in. is I, I, I think about that a lot. I, I would love to see somebody do a well, great, great visual, uh, just right. conveying, to, because people are afraid of two degrees. They, I, I don't know what it is. They just think, it, it just, but it, it has no resemblance to real life. That you're afraid of two degrees like there's just not nobody is afraid of climate in their actual lives and everybody is afraid of it in the abstract whereas in the past it was legitimate to be afraid of climate because you had no industrialization to protect yourself from it but they i mean they were afraid of it for real reasons you know they had a drought everyone died we have a drought you know the price of a you know uh the wheat goes up a little bit yeah uh yeah, I mean, we're we're in a strange place where there there are a lot of uh, careers that are tied to this, and there are a lot of uh, powerful interests that are tied to this, and so we're 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 stuck in this in this mind uh, image that is being constantly fed to us, and uh, but but is it really that difficult to detach from it? I mean, it's. <sighs> Half a degree in the last hundred years. Can anybody detect that? No. You know, there's all this story. There's all there. I, there's no reason to believe that average warming is linked to catastrophic uh, climate events. I don't. There's no evidence for that. If you look at the the historical climate studies of storms, forest fires, all kinds of things. There, there's incredible variability in the last couple of hundred years before the industrial area, the last thousand years, the last 10,000 years. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk here in Canada now about this, this ongoing fire at Fort McMurray that is this massive thing. And a lot of people are saying, well, there you go, clear evidence of, of uh, global warming. Not at all. By far the largest fire in in uh, the Rockies uh, happened in 1910. It was six times larger than the Fort McMurray fire. And this is before there was any talk of industrial CO2. Um, you know, and then if you go back a couple hundred years, there was an even bigger fire. And this is very well recorded in tree, tree ring records. Uh, and these fires are related to drought and to uh, fuel loads, and to um, and th they get particularly uh, big if you happen to have high winds at the same time, which spreads them. It's related to these uh, 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 weather events and uh, cyclical and varying cl regional climate events, such as a period of dry weather. But these have always occurred. Um, they're, they're, they're not occurring more often than they were in the past. Um, I just don't see the evidence. Every time I look at the evidence in detail and I try to see if some author is correct in, make, in, in advancing this, 
I don't see it. I see the opposite. I see reasonable historical climatologists giving all kinds of uh, warnings and examples from the past when things were, were where there were these extreme events. Uh, and, and that's what I see. Um, I'm actually writing a paper these days on forest fires and the, the history of forest fires in relation to these uh, recent events. So, yeah, it, 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 there's, it's a social phenomenon. There's, there's, the scientists are, that are doing it are benefiting from doing this. Yeah, well, I think it's really important for people to hear that from a scientist, uh, because you know they hear it, hear it from a philosopher. It's a little bit, it's a little bit different. Hear it from a social scientist, it's different. But to hear from somebody who's studied it in depth, knows it incredibly well, and just. But I think the, in a sense, the people who know it best are the scientists who are honest, because it's just so blatant that this field is not devoted to understanding climate in a complete objective way nor is it devoted to communicating about it to the public in a way that's that's useful. And so that uh, brings us to the end. Uh, where can people learn more about you and your work so they can read some of the... We'll, we'll link to some of the papers, but uh, I know you blog a lot, among other things. Right. Well, my, my blog, uh, Climate Guy, has on the front page a link to my publications, and there there are links to all the interviews and papers I've written on this topic. Uh, all right. Well, Danny, yeah. thanks so much for coming on the show. It was my pleasure. This is a, a bonus uh, power after hours. Uh, Professor Rancor wanted to make a new point or an additional point, and I wanted to hear it, so uh, go for it. Well, okay. Well, uh, you know, we've, we've been talking about scientists, and what I have noticed is that trend setting is very important in today's North American science and you know, Western science. Uh, there are these major journals, Science and Nature, and they're uh, coveted and people to advance their careers and get big funding, you know, heads of research groups, they need to publish there. And the journals themselves are competing, those two are competing with, with each other. And they also want to uh, initiate trends because that benefits the journal in terms of sales and visibility and so on. So. As a whole, that, that there is a trend-setting effect that is uh, polluting and deteriorating science. And you know, when, when science graduate students enter the field and they start to do research supervised by these heads of laboratories and so on, th one of the first things they have to learn is to stop thinking independently and start following uh, what the supervisor wants you to do because he got a research grant to do it. And, you know, there's a lot of joking between uh, graduate students about this, and there's a, a big adaptation. They have to adapt to that culture. And uh, so the, uh, science itself is being harmed by the way it is funded and by the way that scientists need to publish and where they need to publish and how you get research grants and how the research granting is very concentrated, uh, especially in the United States. Uh, they like to fund you know, what are considered top groups a lot and everybody else gets nothing. So they don't spread it around. They don't allow new ideas to come out in different places. So there, there, there's a lot in the way that science is done that is very, very harmful to science itself. And as a result, you get career scientists who are uh, playing these games in order primarily to advance their careers. Yeah, and I think... There are so many books that that could and should be written about this in in science in general, and then uh, climate science in particular. And there are some, I guess, but I think I think you'd need uh, a scientist or maybe a collaboration between a scientist and some sort of sociologist or type uh, to do it. But I, I know one one concept that I have, which I don't know if you would agree with putting it this way. Is I, I often think of it as competitive science versus uh, monopoly science. In that, if, if you do have one central thing funding it, you run into, I mean, you run into the same problems that you do if you have one coercive monopoly uh, in business. It just becomes very hard to go against it and very incentivized to go forward. Whereas, you know, I, I look at older environments, at least in, in my own field, 
Uh, and I see that it, you know, even in that, in those fields, it was much more competitive. Like you'd have these cliques yeah. that were violently arguing against one another and yeah. saying each other idiots. And now the whole focus is, well, everyone in the field has come to this consensus that two degrees Celsius is death. I and mean, that on its face, that exact number, I mean, that on its face is just religion and it's, and it's, it's, it's authoritarian. And, and so I just, well, you know, Alex, yeah. one, one of the reasons that, uh, you know, competition has disappeared, uh, and instead you get this groupthink. Is the peer review process itself? If you start to have a competing paradigm or a different idea, and you want to compete with the big boys, uh, well, those it's going to be a lot harder to get your papers accepted because the peers that will be evaluating them, you know, a lot of them will be in the opposing camp, and they're going to give you a very hard time. So instead of having your paper accepted within weeks or months, it might drag on for years. And that's going to frustrate your ability to apply for grants and so on. So there's a huge driving force that pushes you towards being nice to everyone. So you read these scientific papers and it, it makes you kind of sick. I mean, they'll, they'll typically, you know, you read between the lines, you know they're not agreeing with so-and-so's work, but they're saying, well, it's been shown that this and that. But we have this other idea. You know, they're very, very, uh, um, they, they will never confront. There are some really bad ideas out there that, 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 that survived for far too long simply because of this culture of not confronting uh, in, in terms of discussion and proposing other ideas and flatly saying, you know, I think that's not the main effect. And I, I, I think it, you're, you're misguided. And so on. You 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 just never see that in the literature uh, these days. So I think that's harmful. Yeah. Well, in a sense, Galileo was su subject to peer review. Oh yeah. And that one, that one really well. Yeah. I think about. It, I mean, because I I made a decision. I was in philosophy, and I made a decision uh, to under no circumstances go to grad school because I regarded it as brainwashing. I didn't even even think at that time about. I mean, I just thought, well, these are the I'm going to have to advance with these clowns uh, and they get to decide everything about my fate. Whereas I figured, well, if you go to the market, then at least some citizens can become interested in your work and you have a better shot uh, of it. Well, and... you're, you're, you're completely right to say that graduate school is a higher level of indoctrination and brainwashing. That is uh, completely established. There's a very important book that does uh, that studies that in detail. It's called Disciplined Minds by uh, a physicist, in fact. Jeff Schmidt wrote this book. And uh, I highly recommend it in terms of understanding how science operates and how professional schools, uh, you know, train and indoctrinate and bring into the fold all the professionals, whether they be uh, medical doctors or lawyers or scientists. Do you... Uh... Since you gave that one, do you? I mean, I'm, I love this topic. So, do you have any other recommendations of, particularly for the layman, on just the how science is or how it gets corrupted? That that is absolutely one of the best. The one I just gave, disciplined minds. Um, there aren't a lot of scientists whistleblowing <laughs> and 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 calling this out, but. There are some in medicine, for example. I, I wrote a paper um, looking at the medicine and cancer research, uh, which is online, um, in which I review this. For example, there are, there are some really interesting whistleblowers in medicine who recently have said that most of medical scientific research is wrong. It's incorrect. And they've explained why, and they've been able to demonstrate that. Um, you know... Medicine is one of these uh, incredible areas. I mean, the third leading cause of death is medical error in North America. This is this is huge. This is nine percent of people will die from medicine. <laughs> so that gives you a sense of how bad it is. Um, and uh, yet nobody's talking about it. You 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 almost never hear about it. But the, the, these statistics have been demonstrated. Uh, repeatedly, there was even a recent article about it that 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 was in the media a lot. So I reviewed all of that, and I reviewed the science of um, uh, cancer treatments, and showed just just how nasty it was, and how it came from again, you know, uh, a kind of corrupt professionalism. Uh, uh, breast cancer treatment, in particular, has been horrendous, 
And only now are scientists admitting through the force of debate that is finally coming out that most of what was done in the past, even in the recent past, was doing much more damage uh, than good. Yeah, that's that's really scary in that realm. The only realm I really know anything about within medicine or health is nutrition, and that's just shocking how irrational that is and how much of a monopoly that is and how much it just switches among these different monopolies and fads and this and and it's just almost impossible to get any kind of understanding of the mechanics of how food affects your body or even what the state of knowledge is because everyone claims certainty and the government makes these recommendations and uh yeah so that's that's well, that's well, a really that's good a, example nutrition because you know that's a that's a good example of where you have this nutrition profession that is trying to convince us that nutrition is a major determinant of individual health, which actually, if you if you do the research, you'll find that that's not true at all. Okay, <laughs> there are. I want to see. I want to see. I want to see that. Uh, yeah, I'm... yeah. Well, it's in it's in my um, uh, part of it is in my uh, review paper about uh, cancer, um, and you know the 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 dominant determinants of individual health are not nutrition. Nutrition plays a role in, when there are clear deficiencies because of very specialized diets and things like that, but in terms of causing cancer, it's just a non-issue. Yeah, and you have so you know you have this book, the China study, and others, which are so confident that well, you know, there's no as long as you're a vegan, you can't get cancer, basically, uh, and you know nothing will ever go wrong. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm really I'm really interested in that. I mean, as we have this discussion, I'm just I'm just struck by how non-competitive in the healthy sense discussions are because you get, I mean, you do get a, a, a partisanship at least in on the level of the internet and the, the culture, not so much I think in in universities, but just, I just think, wow, it'd be, you're somebody I talk to and I think, okay, this is a person who's kind of fun to disagree with, or at least you could get somewhere just by, you know, hearing a good argument, uh, or like a strong argument. One thing with my, you know, moral case for fossil fuels, see, I'd, I'd love for you to read it in particular, because I'm positive, almost positive now, I'd like to think I could convince you of everything from every chapter, but if I didn't, it'd be really interesting to hear what you'd say. Versus most of the people who review it, I mean, first of all, most of them won't, even even those New York Times bestseller, like reviewed by, you know, glowingly in tons and tons of places, the left wouldn't touch it, the environmentalists wouldn't touch it. And the one person who did in a prestigious journal just literally said the essence of Epstein's thesis is, and then it was, we should use fossil fuels forever and never try any alternatives. Like this is a view that no human being has ever held and that is contradicted right. Uh, literally a hundred times in my book and, right. and in, in arguing against her review, we'll probably publish it, but it was stupid because I just had my researcher just take every sentence of hers and then just put a sentence of mine in the book that said the exact opposite. So it's just right. a, a pure straw man. Whereas no, like if someone disagrees with my view of human environmental impact, uh, challenge it, but the, they're so focused on advancing their careers, their, their tribe. There's just so little, so little curiosity and I think so little self-confidence in their ability to to take on an opposing view. So they just use intimidation and, and the comfort of the group. Right, right. Well, you know, my, my view of energy use is, I mean, it, saying that energy use is uh, positive is, is, is just a truism, you know? It's just that you can't even, it's, it's just obvious this, this is what runs uh modern societies this is what allows us to develop and to do things that we otherwise simply couldn't do that's just a, a truism i mean try not having energy consumption at a national level bring it down just 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 do the experiment see what happens you know yeah well that's uh but you know if the the what i would call the anti-humanists i mean they you know, some of them are, are fundamentally against it. I mean, they think it's wrong for us to change anything, and energy is, a, you know, it's our capacity to do work. It's a, it's a change agent, and so you know, they're against it, and I think they're, they're one of the big uh, drivers. Thanks again, and I, I hope we keep in touch. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, contact me anytime. All right, thanks a lot. 
Thanks again to Danny Rancor for coming on the program. I hope you enjoyed both the regular interview and the little segment after it. I guess it was a little, little more than a little. Uh, but in any case, yeah, it was really, really fun talking to him. Uh, he's just, just fun to talk to independent thinkers who are really, really smart. It's, it's rare that those two go together uh, so much, and each is rare, but but the combination is is certainly rare. So he definitely is somebody we could have on the show again. He sounds like he'd be willing to, and definitely he's somebody I'll consult in the future for just trying to get clear explanations of some of these issues. Now, uh, the issue came up during the program of the desire for uh, a way to clearly visualize the nature of the greenhouse effect, as well as to clearly visualize the triviality of a, let's say, two degree Celsius increase, which is supposedly, in average temperature, which is supposedly, you know, the, the worse than, than a plague. Uh, so what I'd like to do is offer a prize to whomever can create a really good one of either of these. So I'll have one for both, or if, if there are, you know, a couple of amazing ones, I'll give you all the prize. Uh, but I'm not guaranteeing a prize to the best, because if the best is no good, I'm not paying. But I'll give $1,000 to anyone who can create a really, really good graphic of one of these two things. Now, it won't be easy because it requires graphic design uh, ability plus an intellectual understanding of the issue. So hopefully today's uh, discussion will help with the, the, you know, the triviality of the two degrees. Uh, I'd recommend Chapter 5 in particular and, and somewhat Chapter 4 of the moral case for fossil fuels for, for that purpose. Obviously, I recommend the whole thing for, for many other purposes. Uh, but yeah, so that is that offer is out there. I'm not going to make a big contest of it, but you can just email any entries to me directly at alex at industrialprogress.net. All right, since we've gone long, I won't say too much more. Uh, most important thing, if you haven't done it already, make sure you're on the newsletter. We've been sending them out every week. Uh, I think there's been some really interesting content, some links to talks that we've been able to get tapes of, or I don't know if it's called tapes anymore, video footage of, and all kinds of other stuff. So it's we try to make it short and sweet, uh, emphasis on both of those. All right, so there's that. So the, the way to subscribe to that is just go to industrialprogress.com, and there's a subscribe uh, a subscribe uh, place to enter the subscribe, what is it called, the subscribe uh, box. I'm losing my words at this point, in the this point late in the in the power hour. Uh, and the other thing is energychampion.net. If you don't have how to talk to anyone about energy, definitely take a look at it. Take a look at the preview at energychampion.net. I'm working on some new content to add to it for free. So this will be added to everybody's version of it, whether you've bought it uh, now or you, you know, whether you bought it in the past, you buy it now, you buy it in the future. It'll be upgraded periodically. And so I have a couple of ideas, including maybe a module on social media, also, definitely a module on how to practice, how to how to different ways to practice, including how to get together a practice group where you can really get good feedback from other people, uh, without me being there. Uh, so I think that's that's uh, that'll be a cool thing. So yeah, energychampion.net. I think it's a uh, it's a cool thing. I've been hearing lately. You know, when I listen to different podcasts, it's pretty funny how how they monetize themselves. You know, you'll hear. Uh, me undies is a big one. So this underwear company that supposedly makes spectacular underwear, at least according to the hosts that get a commission on that. Uh, and everyone is also into stamps.com. So this will probably be funnier if you listen to lots and lots of podcasts, but there are just these recurring suppliers who, whom I guess make good money uh, advertising on certain podcasts. Uh, so strictly speaking, uh, we don't really need money for power hour. I mean, it's something I'm happy to do. It doesn't cost too much. It's, it's very enjoyable. Uh, but in so far as you want to support our sponsors, that would be energychampion.net. Uh, so instead of something irrelevant like stamps.com or MeUndies, although I've heard from many hosts that they're great, check out energychampion.net. All right. Uh, with that, as usual, you know, Facebook, Twitter, check us out, follow us, you know, very important if, if you're not already. Lots of good stuff there. But time to wrap up. So once again, as I've said recently, we're not going to have these power hours every week, at least I'm not sure when that'll happen. But when I get someone 
whom I'm really interested in talking to, I will do Power Hour. So Power Hour is not dead. I really appreciate everybody's positive feedback on it, and you know, we'll we'll see when the next one is. But if you have any ideas for guests, feel free to send them to Alex at industrialprogress.net along with any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail. All right, time to wrap up. Next time, we'll be back with another great guest, another great topic. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour. The antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.